Uh, so today we're going to talk about data preparation and modeling with Jump, and I'll primarily be using uh, Jump Pro for this webinar. So we're going to see tools involved uh, in preparing data for modeling. So we'll talk about some of the key activities that take place, so some of the things we need to do when we're preparing data for modeling. Uh, we'll see tools in Jump data preparation, and we'll use an example for this, uh, the equity data, which can be found in the sample data directory. So the sample data in Jump is under help, and then there's a sample data library which contains uh, many useful data sets. We'll see many tools for predictive modeling in Jump. So we'll see how to use fit model for building least squares uh, regression models, and also for uh, stepwise regression and logistic modeling. We'll use the recursive partitioning platform for uh, classification and regression trees. We'll see how to build neural networks in Jump Pro. A relatively new platform in Jump, Generalized Regression, which is only available in Jump Pro, um, provides a number of um, modeling options, including maximum likelihood um, and penalized regression methods. So we'll see how to use generalized regression for building predictive models. And we'll also see how to use the built-in model validation, model comparison platform for uh, comparing competing models. And then in Jump 13 Pro, there's a new feature, uh, Formula Depot, that allows you to collect all of your formulas for different models that you've built and compare those models uh, and then also deploy those models uh, using different types of scoring codes. If time permits, we'll see how to use the new Text Explorer platform for uh, exploring unstructured data and also preparing data for uh, modeling. Uh, and um, everything that we're going to cover today, I want to point out that we have a variety of resources that are available uh, on our academic community or academic website at jump.com slash teach. So I'll quickly point these out. So at the bottom of our academic website, so jump.com slash academic, are links to all of the resources uh, that our group uh, uh, maintains and has collected uh, over the years. So under Learning Jump, you'll see links to uh, getting started videos. So if you're brand new to Jump, we'd recommend that you watch uh, some of these videos because they're, they're really useful in um, helping with basic navigation uh, and use of Jump. Uh, there's a variety of additional webinars that are, are being provided this fall, uh, and we're organizing our webinars for the spring semester. Now the learning library, uh, the short link for this is jump.com slash learn. And this contains short guides that help us answer the question, how do I do X in Jump? So for example, if you want to build a classification tree or a regression tree or use clustering, uh, on each one of these guides is one page that describes uh, a data set to use, step-by-step -step, uh, uh, keystrokes within Jump, uh, and also provides help with interpreting the results. Uh, for each one of these, you'll also see a short one to three minute video. The case study library provides some really nice comprehensive case studies in a variety of different topics. So these include case studies in, uh, in multiple uh, and logistic regression, uh, and there's also a series of case studies for uh, analytics and predictive modeling. Uh, and finally, I'll point out uh, books in JUMP. There are several books that uh, integrate JUMP that are in the field of predictive modeling and analytics. So with that, I'll return to the journal. I am using a journal throughout this webinar, um, and a couple of more links that I'll point out. Uh, under the Help menu, you'll find the Jump Help, and the Jump Help is a searchable uh, documentation uh, grouped into books, and most of what I'll be covering today, you can find information under Fitting Linear Models or Predictive and Specialized Modeling, uh, and I will introduce a few multivariate uh, techniques as well. And then back to the help menu, uh, one more link that I'll point out uh, is uh, books. So if you'd like PDF versions of the documentation or you'd like to search locally, uh, the books all ship with the software. And finally, there's a Jump user community that has links to additional information and resources, and I'll talk about a couple of these uh, during this webinar. So let's get started with data preparation. The data preparation is one of the most time-consuming aspects of predictive modeling or analytics. Um, there are a number of things that have to be done to prepare data for modeling. So I'll highlight some of these here. 
So we need to do things like pull our data together, compile, combine, and structure our data so it's in an appropriate format or structure for data analysis, uh, explore our data, uh, understand uh, what's in the data set, what's missing, what additional information do we need, assess the quality of the data, are we missing values, uh, do we have a lot of outliers, um, do we have unruly data, do we have a lot of uh, text data, or a lot of categories uh, of categorical variables that need, need to be addressed. Um, we need to clean and transform our data. Uh, we may need to define new features in our data, and I'll talk about this in a moment. We may have data that uh, uh, has a lot of uh, columns, so very wide data, and we may need to employ tools to reduce the dimensionality of our data set, particularly if a lot of our columns are correlated with one another or are redundant. Uh, and finally, in predictive modeling, we're interested in developing predictive models that have um, very high accuracy. Uh, or very low error rate. So a general technique is to, um, to train our model on a subset of our data, to check the model on a second subset of our data that we often call validation data, and then for a selected model to see how well the model works on data that wasn't used in building the model. Um, so uh, we call this, uh, these subsets train, validation, and test, and the general approach we call model validation. So we'll see how to do this uh, in Jump in a moment. Um, I'll provide a highlight of the tools for data preparation in Jump, but then we'll use an, ex uh, an example, the equity data, uh, to illustrate. So for compiling and structuring data, there are a lot of really nice tools in Jump for pulling data into Jump uh, and then uh, massaging the data so it's in a structure that is useful for analysis and modeling. So I'll point some of these out. Uh, under File, uh, open. Um, we can open data in a variety of different formats. So this includes an Excel import wizard that allows you to, um, to look at your data first uh, and adjust um, some parameters to make sure that the data comes in in a format that um, uh, is easy to model or, or use in analysis. You can also import text data, SAS data sets, data sets in a variety of different formats. Under database, there's a, a relatively new query builder that allows you to write SQL query directly from Jump. So you can go out and connect to a database and pull data directly into Jump that way. Uh, you can also use um, uh, connectivity to SAS to browse SAS data and pull SAS data directly into Jump. Or you can write a SAS query to be able to pull a subset of SAS data set uh, directly into Jump. And you can pull data in directly from the internet. Now, if you have data directly in Jump, there's a new feature under the Tables menu. Uh, and I should mention that I'm using um, Jump 13 Pro. Uh, I'm doing this uh, webinar on a Mac. Uh, the Jump runs uh, the same on Mac and Windows. Uh, Jump 13 came out in September. Uh, and there are a few, few new features that I'll highlight today. So one of those new features is this Jump Query Builder. And what this allows you to do is um, if you've got uh, several Jump data tables and they all have information that you'd really like to be able to access uh, from one uh, data set. This allows you to write a query directly in Jump to be able to pull data from these different data sets without opening those data sets. Um, so really nice, useful tool. Um, under tables, you'll also see sort, stack, split. And I don't have time to go into these today, but these are all useful for restructuring your data. So if your data comes in where your values are in separate columns, you may need to stack those values so they're all in one column. Uh, you may need to transpose your data. So the, the features under tables allow you to rearrange your data so it's in a format that's appropriate for analysis. Uh, and the final tool I'll show uh, or talk about under compiling and restructuring data uh, is this feature called virtual join. So Jump generally assumes that all of your data is in one data set. Uh, virtual join allows you, and I'll go ahead and open up a couple of data sets. Um, but what virtual join allows you to do is access data that's stored in another file from one, one file that's linked to that other file. So in this example, I've got some United States um, state information. And this information has a column, or this data set has a column called region. Well, there's a second file, and this file has populations for each of the regions. If I'd like to do an analysis where I'm using the information in the US state abbreviations file, but I want to access the population file, instead of joining these two data tables together, what I'll do is I'll right click on region, 
and select link ID. So this defines region as the link variable. And then within the file that I'm interested in working in, I'll right click and select link reference and I'll point to that file. So now region, there's this, this icon that tells it tells us the region is linked to the column region in another file. I'm able to pull in this information that's in this other file without having that other file open. So now if I'm interested in doing an analysis, I can select the variables and it'll pull in those variables from other files. So this is a really nice way of working with data where several components may reside in other files where we don't have to build one very large data set to encompass all of this information. So we call this virtual join. Now in data exploration, we use a lot of the tools that we would typically use in any analysis for getting to know our data. Um, so our goal here is really to understand what's in the data set, what kinds of problems what might we have, are we missing a lot of values, do we have uh, a lot of skewed distributions, do we have a lot of categorical variables that have a lot of levels. So we'll use the built-in tools for data visualization uh, to get a better understanding of the quality of our data set. So in the example that follows, I'll use columns, columns viewer, and this allows us to get a high-level summary uh, of all of the variables in our data set. Analyze distribution, so this is the first option under the Analyze menu, and this will give me a look at the univariate distributions for all of our variables, but these are all linked together, so it gives us a feel for the potential bivariate relationships. And we also get a feel for the, the shape and spread and centering of our distributions. And then Graph Builder, which allows us to look at several variables at a time, and it's also a really nice launching point if we realize that we need to transform variables. So again, we'll see this in an, in an example in a moment. Uh, driving new variables, this, this can include uh, transforming variables, recoding data. So if we have data that is categorical and is messy, we might have um, trailing spaces, we might have an issue with capitalization. This allows us to clean up categorical data. We may have continuous variables that have messy uh, or poorly behaving distributions, so we can um, use the make binning formula utility, or we can use the, the formula editor cr to create a formula to bin continuous variables. Uh, and I'll point out, we won't show it, but there is an uh, uh, add-in on our jump community called interactive binning, um, and this allows you to bin continuous data into buckets to make it a little bit uh, more manageable for analysis. So we'll see a, a few of these features as we go along. There's some nice tools for dealing with missing values. Under Analyze Predictive Modeling, sorry, Screening, uh, we've added a few of these. So there's a really nice utility for uh, exploring outliers. There's another one for exploring missing values. To get a feel for uh, the pattern of missingness, under Tables, we'll use Missing Data Pattern. There's this feature, Informative Missing. And again, we can use Recode to deal with missing values. Nice tools for dealing with outliers, including explore outliers uh, and some robust methods. And then I won't have a lot of time to talk about uh, multivariate procedures, but there are a lot of nice built-in tools for reducing the dimensionality of a data set. So this predictor screening option allows us to actually utilize Bootstrap Forest to take a really wide data set and narrow down the list of potential predictors for modeling uh, to just a subset of the larger set. Uh, principal components and clustering are available, um, and these are both commonly used dimension reduction procedures. So let's go right into an example. Uh, and these data are the equity data. And what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at the data, and we're going to see some of these built-in tools for dealing with uh, data quality issues that we've uh, identified in the data set. So the data are equity. And again, this is data from the sample data directory under the help menu. Uh, the column has, uh, or the data table has 14 columns, and to make this a, bit, a little bit longer, we have uh, almost 6,000 rows. The little dot, anytime you see a dot in jump for a continuous variable, this tells us that we're missing values. Uh, and again, if you're relatively new to jump, the icon next to the variable name under the columns panel tells us what type of data we're dealing with. So when you see the, the red bars, this says we've got categorical data. Where you see the blue triangles, this says we've got continuous data. As I hold my mouse on top of these variables, you'll see that a little note pops up. Um, so within the column information for these variables, in fact, I'll right-click on this variable and select column information. 
This is where we tell Jump how to handle this variable for analysis, and we can also add notes. So the note was added to give us a little bit of information about this particular variable. Uh, while we're here, I'll mention that there are a number of different column properties that can be set to aid in, in modeling and preparing data. And a couple of these that I'll point out, um, missing value codes is important. So if you pull in data from another source and say 999 is used to code uh, data as missing, then you can assign a missing value code here. Um, if you're dealing with categorical data, that comes in, for example, as 01 or 0123, and you'd like to show the labels instead, you can add value labels. And value ordering is useful uh, if, for example, you'd like to change the order that a categorical variable displays or the labels of a categorical variable displays on a graph. So, for example, if I pull data in and the data are coded as um, or have values small, medium, large, the data are going to plot in alphanumeric order. So we can use value ordering so that the data are actually ordered small, medium, and then large. Actually, it would be small. Yeah, small, medium, large is what we'd like there. Um, so anyway, these column properties are there. Um, and there's a few other column properties. Um, and I'll talk about informative missing uh, in a few moments. Uh, informative missing uh, is used to tell Jump how to, how to handle missing data when I'm building predictive models. So I'll hit cancel here. Um, so, so to get a first peek at these data and understand what kinds of problems we might have in the data set, I'll go to Columns and then Columns Viewer. And Columns Viewer allows us just to get familiar with our data. I'll select every variable in the data set except validation. And I'd like to see the quartiles. So if I select Show Quartiles and then Show Summary, and I'll hit Clear Select, Deselect the Variables. What this does is it shows me basic summary statistics for all of the variables in the data set. So I can see the number of observations. I see the number missing. So notice that some of these are missing quite a few values. For categorical data, I see the number of categories. So bad is two categories. Reason is two. Job is six. And if I take a step back and take a look at the data, um, a little bit of background on this data. Um, so these are some data, and we're looking at um, a loan, and the loan can be good or bad risk. Um, the data are actually coded as 0, 1, and this little asterisk tells us that we've used value labels where if I've got 0, it's coded as bad risk, or I'm sorry, 0 is coded as good risk, and 1 is coded as bad risk. So here we're interested in building a predictive model to predict bad risk loans. And we've got a number of, of pieces of information for each customer. So We've got some categorical variables. Uh, we've, for continuous variables, we've got the minimum and maximum values. So this, this is useful in understanding the range of values. So for example, under value, um, this is the value of the loan. Um, the minimum value is 8,000. The maximum value is 855,000. So we've got quite a range there. Um, if I look at the median, median and the mean, I'm generally interested in if, whether there's a big difference between the mean and the median, which would indicate skewness. For some of these variables, I see that there are a lot of zeros. So if I look, for example, at delinquent, the median is zero, the lower quartile is zero, the upper quartile is zero, and the interquartile range is zero, this tells us that at least 75% of these values are zero. Um, the maximum value is 15. So this is likely to be count data. In fact, any, any one of these that starts with zero is likely a count variable. Now, if I'm interested in, in taking this a step further, I can select the variables of interest here and select distribution. Or I can launch distribution directly from the Analyze menu. And I'll go ahead and do that here. So I'll go to Analyze, Distribution. And selecting variables in Jump is a matter of clicking and dragging in one keystroke, or selecting a variable and holding on the Shift key, and we'll select all of the variables in between when we click. And I'll click OK. So what kinds of things do we see here? Uh, by default, the view is vertical. I'll use stack to convert it to um, a horizontal layout. So I've got about 20% of the customers with bad risk. I can see the shapes of the distributions. So for continuous variables, I'm interested in, in whether I've got a lot of outliers, the shapes of the distributions. I'm interested in whether I've got missing values. Uh, for the categorical data, 
I'm interested in the number of categories and what some of the categories are relatively small. So I can see that sales and sell have relatively few values compared to other and some of these other categories. Year on the job. For all of these, I'm looking to see whether the distributions make sense. So if this is the year on the job, it makes sense that it would start at zero with a tail that that um, that that quickly declines as we go forward. For things like derogatory and delinquent, I can see that I basically got data in buckets. So I've got values at three, two, three, four, five, but most of our values are at zero. In fact, at least 75% of our values are zero. Same thing for delinquent. So by doing this, I'm getting a feel for what kinds of things might I need to address in order to be able to model effectively with these data. So let's talk about some of the things I might do with this data set. Um, I'll, t I'll start with a variable job. So if I, if I go back and look at distribution of job, I can see that job has several categories. It's missing 279 values. And some of these categories are relatively small in terms of the number of counts. So one way of addressing the missing values uh, and also dealing with the low counts is to use recode. So with job selected, I'll go to columns and then recode. And under the red triangle, you'll see lots of options for cleaning up potential data quality issues, convert to title case, uppercase, lowercase, trim out white space. I can group similar values. In this case, I might do something like assign missing, where there, there are no values. Or I might group two values together. So I might group these, and I'll just select the, the values and hit group, into self, and I'll rename the self slash sales. So in cases where I've got relatively low counts, I may not need to do this uh, if I were really doing modeling with these data. Um, but for illustration, this is a nice way of, of combining uh, buckets of data. Now under the Done button, there are some options here. If I click In Place, it'll replace the data um, with these recoded data. What I generally like to do is to use Formula Column. And what Formula Column does is it gives us a new column with the data recoded, and it's storing the logic for recoding the data. So this is the formula editor, and basically what it's done is it's, it's set up a conditional if statement or a match statement. So if job is missing, call it missing. If job is sales or self, then recombine or combine these into sales and self. Otherwise, populate the new column with whatever was in the job column. So recode is really nice for cleaning up uh, categorical data. Uh, I can also bin values. So binning values, uh, for example, uh, if I look at Derog, I'll go ahead and create a distribution of derogatory. So binning values is a matter of changing this over to discrete buckets. So I might have a bucket that's zero. I might have a bucket that's one or more. Uh, and also missing values, I might have another bucket with missing. So to do this, I would use an if statement. To create a new column, I'll double click. And then I'll right click and select formula. And from this formula editor, I'll use the functions on the side. I'll ask for a conditional if. And this populates the formula with some expressions. So if derog, and then I'll use a compare statement, is less than or equal to 0. And then in the then clause, this is what I'm going to group it into. Then I'll call this none. Now with the none argument highlighted, I'll click the caret, and I'll insert another argument. So for the second expression, again, if to rog, and now I'll use is greater than 0, again, I'll do double quotes. I'll call this one or more. And then for this last one, I'm actually going to add one more argument. Again, to rog, now I'm going to use is missing. So if derogatory is missing, then I'm simply going to call that missing. So this is a really nice way of binning continuous data where you might have a really unruly distribution and you want to put it in discrete buckets. Uh, there is a utility. So under columns, um, utilities, there is a make binning formula uh, um, utility. Um, but I like the ability to use the formula editor to create these manually. Um, so what are some other things we might do? Uh, we might take a variable like value, and we might decide that we need to transform value. 
So if I go to Graph Graph Builder, I'll look at the distribution in Graph Builder this time instead of distribution, and I'll just look at the distribution of value. I'll use this little grabber to get a better understanding of the shape of the distribution, and I can see that it's it's right skewed and there are some relatively extreme values. If I decide that I need to use this in a model and it needs to be transformed to normality, within any analysis platform and also within the data table, you can right click on a column and you can select a transformation. So for example, you know, I've got different distributional transformations, different random functions. Under transform, I'll select log. And what this does is it creates a temporary variable down at the bottom of the list. But this variable is active. So if I want to be able to explore this particular variable to see if this does a good job of normalizing my data, I'll drag this variable and drop it on top of the x-axis, and it replaces the original variable. And now if I look at this distribution, it looks much more uh, normally distributed. Now if I want to retain this variable, this is a temporary variable. It's not actually in my data set yet. I'll right click and select Add to Data Table. And then back in the data table, you'll see a new column. And any time in jump you see a plus sign next to a column, that indicates that there's a stored formula. So basically, jump just wrote this formula for us. Um, we could have done it manually by using one of the transcendental functions. If we know what transformation is required, we can also do it directly from the data table. So if I right-click on a column and select New Formula Column, this will allow me to apply all sorts of transformations. We can also select multiple columns. And let's say, for example, we want a ratio or percentage. If I select two columns and right-click New Formula, now we've got some additional options. So I might want the sum or the difference or a ratio or an average, or I might want to aggregate these in some way. So really useful for, um, for pr preparing data and creating new derived variables. Uh, for missing data um, in a data set like this, I might explore whether the data is missing at random or if, it is, um, some, if there's something systematic going on. So a really nice feature for doing this is called missing data pattern. So this gives us a snapshot at the nature of the missingness in our data set. So I'll select all of the variables and add columns. And the resulting table gives us a summary of the columns that are missing values. So this first row where I see 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, if there's a 1, it says that this um, the data is missing for that particular variable. So only 3,364 3, rows are not missing any values. 883 are missing just debt-to-income ratio. And some of these we see are missing a lot of values. So there's 19 that are missing all of the variables at the end of the data set. There are a couple of options here, and I won't go too far into these, but these allow you to visualize the nature of your missingness. So anywhere where you see red colors, this says we're missing a lot of values. Um, so we've got this box here and this box here where we're missing zero or only one value. But this can give us a really good feel for if we're missing data across all of our variables or just within particular variables. And I'll go ahead and close this out. Now to deal with missingness, there are different ways of dealing with missingness um, under Analyze, Screening, there's an Explore Missing Values. Uh, utility. So if I select just the continuous variable here, I'll go ahead and select all of them and it'll bump out two of those guys. Um, this gives us some options for dealing with uh, missing values uh, and imputing missing values. Uh, I can also impute missing values from the multivariate platform. Uh, if I know that I'm uh, missing a value and I'd like Jump to include um, this missingness or this missing information in my analysis, um, then I can use uh, an informative missing column property. And most of the analysis platforms in Jump also have the ability to do this. Um, so for example, if I take uh, value and I go to the column information window for value, there's a column property down towards the bottom called informative missing. So what this does is it tells Jump anytime I fit a model to impute the mean for missing value but also to add a second column, which tells us whether that value is missing or not. So we can do this directly within a modeling platform, but we can also do it for particular variables if we know that there are issues. So I'll hit Cancel here. Um, the last thing I want to talk about um, is how to make a validation column. So if I were to build uh, a predictive model using these data sets, 
the data set for bad as a function of these other variables or as a function of the clean variables. In fact, I'll go ahead and go to the clean data set. So in this clean data set, and by the way, we'll make this journal available, and these data sets are embedded in the journal. So if you click on the links, it'll allow you to open the data set. Um, so I've got original variables, and I've got a lot of transformations and cleanup work that I've done. But let's say I want to be able to create a validation column. I'm going to use these data for modeling. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to partition these data into subsets. And the best way to do this is to go to Analyze, Predictive Modeling, and then Make Validation Column. And if you're in Jump 12, this option is under the Columns menu, menu under Models Utilities. And this is the Jump Pro feature. So what this allows me to do is tell Jump what percentage of my values I'm going to use um, to train or build my models. And I'll put 60% I'll, I'll put of my data to training the model. What percent I'm going to use to validate the model or to check the model. And, and many model uh, platforms, this is also used to stop model growth or model building. And then what percent of my data I'm going to use that's not used in the model building process at all, but is held out to check the model afterwards to see how well the model performs on data not used in modeling. So I'm going to, I'm going to partition this data set into three sets. And I'll call the column validation. And there are different ways to do this. We, you can have data completely at random. You can have a fixed random with a random seed. And if you're teaching or you want repeatability, then using a random seed is useful here. So for example, if I plug in a, a random seed of 1, 2, 3, if somebody else is creating a validation column using the same data and they use this same feature, then they would get the same partitioning of the data. Uh, in cases where uh, we have an unbalanced response, in this case we've got 20% uh, in our target category, uh, stratified random is useful. And you can use stratified random for your predictor or for your response, but also for predictors. So if I select bad here, then it's going to sample evenly good and bad in each of the um, training validation and test sets. So I'll go ahead and select just fixed random here. And the way Jump handles validation or Jump Pro handles validation is by creating a column. And Jump recognizes that any time the value training is here, to use the corresponding observations to train the model, validation to, to, to check the model, and then test is held completely out of the model. So I'm going to close this data set, and let's talk about predictive modeling. So there's a lot of work done to prepare data for modeling. In fact, it's one of the time-consuming aspects of modeling. Um, but we're going to skip ahead and talk about um, some of the predictive modeling tools. And I'll start with a data set that has a continuous response. So this data set, uh, this is data that I downloaded from um, the city of Boston, uh, gov. So this is data on uh, assessment values for homes in a neighborhood in Boston. The neighborhood is East Boston. I'm interested in looking at total value of these homes as a function of a lot of characteristics. Uh, and these are data that I've already cleaned up. So, so I've done a little bit of recoding of building style uh, and some of these other variables uh, to make it uh, a little bit easier to work with. But what I'm interested in doing is predicting total value. So let's take a look at this data. So I'm going to start by just graphing my data. Uh, and anytime we do any sort of predictive modeling, we want to start by getting a, a really good first-hand picture of our data. Um, this data has latitude and longitude. So by dragging those variables on, it's plotting my points. And each one of these points is a house. It's plotting it geographically. And I'm going to right click and add a background map. And if I select street map service, this goes out and connects to a server that's able to draw um, the, the latitude and longitude uh, with the map from the server. Um, this allows me to zoom in and look at the street level view. Um, so each one of these points is a home. And I can hold my mouse over the point, and I can see the value of the home and different characteristics. So I'd like to develop a predictive model for property values um, for the homes in this neighborhood. Now, there are a few other things I can do here. For example, if I want to be able to explore, for example, total value, I can color the homes by total value. And I can see the homes in this neighborhood up here um, are a little bit more expensive than some of the homes in some of the other areas. So I would drag and drop and explore different values um, to see which values might be indicative of home prices. So I'm going to go ahead and close this uh, so we get a feel for uh, this neighborhood. In fact, this, this airport here is Boston Logan International Airport. 
So let me close this. The variables themselves, if I take a look at the predictor variables, and I'll go ahead and stack this. Several variables. We can see lot square footage, so some large houses, some small houses. Near built, we've got some very old homes, some that are not so old. Living area, floors. So these are all characteristics of the homes in the neighborhood. And as I scroll through, um, remodel, building styles. So some of these have uh, a lot of categories. I might want to uh, combine some of these. Same with roof type. We see some that are very low in terms of counts finish, heat pipe. As I scroll through this, there's nothing indicating the geographic location of the properties. The only thing we have in the data set that does this is latitude and longitude. So if I look at latitude and longitude, I'll go ahead and stack this again, and go ahead and recreate that geographic map. So I'll just run this little script. In building this model, it might make sense to try to pick up variables that tell us something about the location. So for example, if I click and drag and highlight some of these values, I can see that there are really some different geographic locations within, these, within this neighborhood. So one way of dealing with this is to apply a multivariate procedure uh, called clustering or hierarchical clustering. So I'm going to create a feature, or define a feature, using clustering. So I'll go to multivariate methods, actually clustering, and hierarchical clustering. And I'll simply use latitude and longitude. What this is going to do is it's going to group homes that are really close together. And the longer these lines are, the further apart the clusters are from one another. So if I click and drag, we start where we've got individual homes. And if you keep an eye on the map in the background, notice that it's actually grouping these homes into neighborhoods or sub-neighborhoods. So I can use this to define a geographical effect or a location effect. So for example, if I stop here where I've got five clusters, I can see that there are five regions to the data. And if I save this out to the data table under Save Clusters, then this becomes a variable that I can use for predictive modeling. So I've already done that in the background. Um, and let's go ahead and talk about modeling now. Uh, there's other things I might do first. So for example, I might transform data. So I might look um, at different variables and see what's important, but I might also uh, do some transformations of variables, so I'm going to skip over that. I would probably also look at the nature of the correlation between variables. So this is under multivariate, multivariate. I can see that some of the variables are highly correlated with one another. So this is all work that I would do before uh, doing any sort of modeling with these data. Uh, but let's go straight into building a regression model. So under Analyze Fit Model, this is our multi-purpose modeling platform. Uh, I'm modeling total value as a function of all of these predictors. I've got 17 predictors, and I'll include all of the predictors in the model. I could also include interactions. So if there are interactions that I want to add, for example, I can add in interactions for all the continuous variables. If I select all of the continuous variables and select macros factorial to degree, this will add in interactions for all of those two-way interactions, or all those, all those continuous variables. Since I divided my data into training, validation, and test sets, I did this earlier, I'll add validation here. So this will build a model on the data that has validation, or has, has training uh, in this validation column. And it'll keep track of the model, and it'll report validation statistics for the validation set. I'm going to add in one more variable here. I'm going to add in cluster. So from this platform, the default personality is standard least squares regression. We can also do stepwise regression for model selection. Uh, and I'll show generalized regression in a few moments. But for now, I'll go ahead and click Run. And the first thing you see is an actual bipredictive plot. So you can think of this as a residual plot, where the blue line is the overall mean. Across the bottom, we see the values that our model predicts for value. And on the y-axis is, is the value that we actually observed. We see that we've got one value way up here uh, that looks like it might be an outlier. So this gives us an overall feel for the fit of our model. There's an effect summary table. And the effect summary table has um, p-values for all of the terms in our model and makes it easy for us to reduce our model. So for example, if I click on something here at the bottom, so these are all p-values that uh, these are terms that are not significant, if I select these, I can hit remove. 
and I can continue this by, by slowly moving. And this is equivalent to doing backwards stepwise selection. So as I slowly reduce this model, all of the statistics that are displayed update automatically. So I'll tuck some of these other things away. And I'll go ahead and just remove all these that are not significant. Now I can also use a stepwise platform itself to do model selection instead of doing this manually. So slowly reducing the model. Now normally I would be looking at residuals. I might be looking at some other diagnostics as well. But I'll just do this for the, for the sake of time. So I'm slowly reducing our model by getting rid of things that are not significant. Now I'm not removing any of these terms that have the caret because the caret is telling us that the term is included in an interaction that's higher up in the list. So anything that's involved in an interaction needs to stay in the model. So I'll basically stop there. So what I've just done is build a model, and we can see the things that are most significant, lot square footage. And here's that cluster variable. So location, the location effect is really important in predicting total value. Thanks to your finish, whether it's been remodeled or not, what it, whether it has AC or not, half bath. So from here, we can, we can explore this model. Um, by default, in Jump 13, we'll see this thing called an, a prediction profiler. And for any time you fit a model in Jump, you'll see that there are a lot of things under the top red triangle. And we tuck away options under the red triangle. So under regression reports, you'll see if you're looking for the ANOVA table, you can ask for ANOVA table or the high level summary of fit. Under estimates, show prediction expression will show the formula for our model. Um, for categorical variables, Jump uses what we call effect coding. So this is the minus 1 plus 1 coding scheme. Uh, if you select indicator parameterization estimates, this provides a model where the estimates are using a 0, 1 dummy coding or indicator coding. So this would match what you would get in SAS. So these red triangles and the options under the red triangles provide a lot of additional options. And profiler is one of the options under factor profiling. Uh, if you're interested in looking uh, at model diagnostics, uh, under save columns, you'll see options for exploring residuals and student size residuals. You can save the formula out to the data table. You can look at uh, confidence intervals or prediction intervals. Um, and a new feature in Jump 13 is to publish the prediction formula. And what this does is it publishes the formula out, and I'll go ahead and select this now, to what we call a formula depot. And the formula depot allows you to collect all of your models. And then from here, you can, uh, you can models. Or you can write out the model in C or Python or JavaScript. So any one of these will actually write out the code. So in this case, I selected um, C. It will write out the code to be able to deploy this model throughout the organization. So I'll go ahead and close that. And I'll close the formula depot for now. And what the profiler does is it allows us to explore uh, our coefficients. So the steeper the slope, the more significant a term is. If the slope increases, it tells us that our predictive response increases as we change the value of that, partic that particular predictor. So if I change lot square footage from the low value to the high value and don't change any of the other values, then we're seeing the how the predictive response changes. And this value here is a confidence interval for the response. So some of these are relatively steep. Some of them, like gross area, are relatively flat. But notice as I change gross area, the slope for living area increases. So this is an indication that we have an interaction between gross area and living area. Since we add, added a validation column, then JUMP is, is producing um, statistics for the training set. So this is the set that was used to build the model. And RASE is the same thing as root mean square error. And we also see the values for the validation set. So the, the training set has an R square of 83.94, or 0.8394. And what we're looking for is we hope that our statistics for a validation set are fairly close. So if we see that this R square is substantially lower, that's an indication that we've overfit our model. We'd also like for the R square or the Rumi square error RASE to be very similar. So the model was built using just the training set, and then it's applying that model to the validation set to see how well the model actually works. Now, 
under the Red Triangle Prediction Profiler, and by the way, this profiler is available from any modeling platform in Jump, if you've got a big model like this where you've got a lot of terms in the model, then it's difficult to see which of the variables are most, most important if you control for all the other variables. So a very nice tool here is this option, Assess Variable Importance. And what this does is it runs a simulation that isolates out the effects of each of the individual terms. So it produces a marginal model plot so we can see that independent of all the other variables, as the lot square footage increases, so does the total value. And it's sorting these in, in order of importance. So the most important item is lot square footage, followed by rooms and gross area. And then cluster actually drops down on the list. Uh, also from this red triangle next to the profiler uh, is a simulator that allows you to do Monte Carlo simulations. So I'll save this formula out to the data table. And anytime you save the formula out to the data table, you'll see new columns appear. And when I right click on this formula, then it's basically writing out all of the parameter estimates in that model um, that we, we actually didn't talk about this in Jump. But it's basically writing out the formula for our linear model. And then if we add new rows to the data table, it'll make predictions of those new rows. So that was a quick peek at multiple regression. Let's talk about some of the other modeling tools. Under Analyze, Predictive Modeling, you see Neural Networks and Partition. Partition is classification and regression trees. Um, so let's take a quick look at Partition here. And I'll, I'll set this up the same way. I've got total value as a Y. I've got all these predictors. I'll add cluster. And I'll add validation. Now from method, we can select a decision tree. Uh, and a few other options uh, that we might uh, want to explore for this particular uh, data set. Uh, a decision tree will build uh, basically a tree where it's doing a series of binary splits. And we'll see this in a moment. Strap Forest will, um, will also build trees. It'll build a number of small trees that are combined to make a forest. Um, and Boosted Tree um, is also going to build um, trees, but it builds a series of individual trees, one on top of the other. So we'll talk about this very quickly as we're going along. So I'm going to click OK. And the graph at the top tells us what our overall average uh, property value is, or total value is. And each point is simply scattered relative to that mean. So this value is 526,000. This one is 509,000. The values below the line are less than the mean. And we get starting values. And we see that the overall average mean is 241, and the standard deviation is 77. So what tree methods are going to do, and in this case, since we have a continuous response, we're going to fit a regression tree. If we have a categorical response, we would fit a classification tree. It, they look for variables that, if we were to form subsets by splitting this variable into two subsets, those subsets have a mean that, are, that is as far apart as possible. So it basically looks at every single variable and looks at every value for every variable to find a cut point that will force the subsets or two subsets that are formed to have means that are as far apart as possible. Uh, if this was categorical data, we'd be looking at, at probabilities or proportions rather than means. So it sorts through everything, and it does a p-value for every single place that might possibly split the data into two subsets. And instead of reporting a p-value, it reports this log worth statistic. The higher the log worth, the lower the p-value. So it reports on a log worth, and then it reports a cut point. And wherever you see this little asterisk, this is telling you that this is the variable and the cut point that will be the first split point. So if I click split here, the data are split up above. The relative width here for um, lot square tells us that we've got a lot more values that are less than 3450 than we have that are greater than that. But we also see these lines that are drawn at the means for each of those, those values. So we're basically building a logic statement. If lot square footage is less than 3450, then the mean is 203,000. If it's greater than or equal to that, then it's 314,000. Now this process continues. I've got two sets of candidates, and it's going to look through all the possible splits for this node and all the possible splits for this node. And the second split is on year built. So if I've got a relatively small house built before 1991, the average price is 19, uh, 199,000. If it's greater than or equal to that, it's 320,000. 
Now, since I have validation, if I click Go, Jump automates this process, and it keeps splitting and keeps splitting and keeps splitting, and it keeps track of the validation R square. So the validation R square is this red line, and it basically tries to find a point where the validation R square stops improving. So it found a point here at 22 splits, and it splits an additional 10 times after that. And if the validation R square doesn't improve any further, then it prunes it back to this point. So our final model has 22 splits. And let's see what that looks like. If I click on the red triangle, we can see um, the splits up above, but it's a little bit difficult to see. A small tree view can give us a summary of the splits that were made. And again, with 22 splits, it's a little bit difficult to see. So we can look at the column contributions. And column contributions gives us a feel for the most important variables, the variables that were involved in the most splits. And we see a similar theme to what we saw in regression. Lot square footage, living area, year built, gross area, clustering, finish. So basically, we've built a model that's a series of if-then if, if statements. And we can also save that formula out to the data table. Now, an alternative approach to building a straight classification tree or regression tree is to use Bootstrap Forest or Boosted Tree. And very quickly, what these are, I'll go ahead and click Recall to pull in what I did last time. What a bootstrap forest is, is it's going to build a series of very small trees. And then it's going to combine those together. So our final model is going to be an average of the predictions from each of the individual trees. I'll click OK here. And there are some controls. We can specify how many trees to build. And we're ultimately building a forest. So the default is to build 100 trees where the trees are all relatively small. And you can change these different settings to explore different options. And you can also set a random seed here because there is randomness. But if I click OK here, you'll see what happens. I'll go ahead and show the trees. And by the way, we're getting these, these statistics that appear here so we can compare these different models in terms of performance. My column contributions, you'll actually see that there are more variables that have entered into the model. Um, when you run a straight decision tree or a, class of, or a regression tree, um, what happens is the very first split can't control all of the other splits that are made. So Bootstrap Forest allows other variables to enter into the model. So that's why we see additional variables here. And then what we've essentially done is, and I'll show the trees, is we've built a forest, and that forest is comprised of as many trees as we specified. In fact, it stopped at tree 15. So there's an early stop. So here we've got a relatively small tree and another small tree, and another small tree. And the final model will be an average of all of those trees. The final option here is Boosted Tree. Now, Boosted Tree, and I'll go ahead and hit recall here, what Boosted Tree does is it builds a small tree, and then it calculates the standardized residuals or error from that tree, and it builds a tree on top of that, and another tree, and another tree. So this is actually a layering sort of process. Um, and here we can randomly sample from our data, and also randomly, randomly sample from our columns. We can do the same thing in Bootstrap Forest. I'll click OK here. And again, we get overall statistics. Uh, and we get the ability to see which variables entered the model. And we can save this formula out. So I'm going relatively quickly here. Um, so those are tree-based methods. Um, a neural network is a form of a nonlinear model. So if I populate this the same as I have before, I add clustering again and add validation. And what we're going to do here is we're going to build a model. And the model can have multiple layers and multiple functions. In fact, I'll go ahead and click Go here so we can create a model. And look at the diagram to see what we've just done. So basically, we've got a series of inputs. So these are all of our inputs. And then we've got a hidden layer. And by default, we have three nodes in our hidden layer. And those nodes follow uh, an activation function. So there are three possible activation functions. The tan h, which is sigmoidal in shape, like a logistic function, linear, or Gaussian. And then our final model is a linear combination of the models from each of these nodes in the hidden layer. So this is a nonlinear model that tends to do a really, really go good job of predicting but it tends to be a little bit of a black box. It's also a highly parameterized model. So if I were to look at this model, 
um, and, and look at the estimates for this model, and we can see that there are a lot of things that are estimated, are being estimated. So for the hidden layers, I've got all these parameters, um, and then I've also got things that I'm estimating in the output layer. So very nice model for making predictions, uh, but not a very good model if you're really trying to understand which variables are important. Now the last type of model I'll show here under fit model, and I'll go ahead and hit recall, is under personality and it's generalized regression. So generalized regression uh, is a modern modeling platform um, that is a, really a modern approach to generalized linear modeling where you can specify the response distribution. Um, you can also have censoring here. And when I click run, by default, it performs um, a maximum likelihood analysis, which is the same as the standard least squares. If I had a categorical response, so for example, good or bad, or pass or fail, uh, it'll allow me to do logistic regression. And then there are several different approaches to building a model here. So standard least squares is a default. I can do forward regression. Uh, lasso, elastic net, ridge, uh, double lasso, these are all penalized methods. And I'll tuck this away, and if, to apply one of these penalized methods so we can see what happens here, I'll click Go. And basically what happens is that jump is applying a penalty. So our parameter estimates can be inflated if there's correlation. And it's applying a penalty. So here we've got a full model. And as it applies the penalty, the parameter estimates are shrunk. So we're actually introducing a bias. And here I've selected lasso. The panel on the side is basically telling me at what point I have my best model. So the top line is the negative log likelihood for my validation set. The bottom line is for my training set. So it's trying to, to, to basically minimize the parameter estimates by applying a penalty. The end result is a model that is basically a linear model. So if I were to save this out, we would have a model that was highly interpretable. So let, let's take a look at these different models. And I've actually created several different models. And I'm going to run um, the Formula Depot. So I've actually stored all of these models out to the Formula Depot. So I ran several different models, a least squares model, our classification tree, a bootstrap forest, a boosted tree. I ran a couple of neural nets. And I did several different uh, generalized models. And if I want to compare these models, under the red triangle in the Formula Depot is a model comparison option. This option is also available if you don't use the Formula Depot in Jump Pro under predictive modeling, model, make, uh, sorry, model comparison. So if I've saved the col columns out to the data table, I can also access the model comparison that way. So basically what this does is it allows me to look at fit statistics for all of the different models that I've fit. And if I want to compare these statistics on just the validation set, then I can see the best model in terms of RASE it's actually this one called a two-stage forward selection. So basically, this is a generalized procedure where I'm fitting a model where I've got interactions. And it first checks which two-way interactions are significant. And then it finds which main effects are significant. So my best model is actually this bottom model here. Now, if I wanted to be able to deploy that model, I can use a Formula Depot and write out scoring code for, 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 any, for this model in any one of these types of formats. Now, this whole example was based on using a continuous response. Well, what if I had a categorical response? So for example, if I have a data set, um, and I'll go back to my journal here, um, like Titanic passengers, where I've got a response, yes or no, and several different predictors, or the equity data that we saw earlier, where we're looking at good or bad. Well, the same sort of thing applies. So we can use the same sorts of modeling approaches. Um, instead of doing re least squares regression, we do nominal logistic. I can still do classification trees instead of regression trees, bootstrap pores, boosted trees. Um, and I can still use this model comparison platform. So the mechanics are all very similar. Uh, instead of looking at root mean square error or R square, I'm looking at the misclassification rate. So here I can compare the misclassification rate for several competing models to be able to pick the best model. So I think I'm out of time. I didn't have a chance to talk about the Text Explorer. Um, there are some nice webinars out there. Uh, and I'll open it up for questions in a moment. But I do want to remind you that there's additional information in our learning library. If you go to jump.com slash teach, you'll find links to live and on-demand webinars and a lot of really good information uh, in our help files. 
and several books on predictive modeling and analytics uh, uh, available from junk.com slash teach. So 